All right, so for the toll-like receptors, um, this is uh, lots of things we can say about them, but structurally they can be either as, they always exist as dimers for one, dimers here. They can either be hetero or homo. I think this is a picture of TLR4 if I'm not mistaken, and you'll notice that it's two uh, homo dimers because they're both exactly the same. So they have two structural domains. And then there's a variable extracellular, or in other contexts we'll talk about this, but really there's just the domain that is for recognition, which is, consists of this that I'm kind of circling with the magenta here. This is the area where the pathogen-associated molecular pattern is going to bind. This is a leucine-rich repeat region, which I think is weird because <laughs> leucine um, is a hydrophobic amino acid. This is anywhere from 20 to 30 amino acids long. And um, in the internal side though, and I'll switch colors to blue to, to really just show what I'm talking about here, this is the conserved region, this is a signaling domain. So this right here is a variable, but all toll-like receptors have the exact same, or very similar at least, um, signaling domain. And we call this a toll interleukin-1 receptor because that's how we first discovered it as that. So this doesn't change, but this out here does. Which makes sense, right? Because toll-like receptors all do the same thing, but they all have different things that they bind to, different ligands. Okay, so for toll-like receptors, um, for purposes of this, there's 10 of them. Um, I, I doesn't talk about the other 15, I, that's just fun facts. Um, there's 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, which are all on the, surf on the cell surface. So if it's on the outside of the cell, it's really good in recognizing anything that is not a viral or intracellular pathogen. For toll-like receptors 3, 7, and 8, these are internal, and they usually tend to be on the endosomes. So obviously if they're internal, really good with viruses, but other type of intracellular compartments um, that you wouldn't find here. So well, as you're going through here and thinking, well, what could the possible ligands be for toll-like receptors? Think about structures that are unique to pathogens, like the lipopolysaccharide earlier, double-stranded RNA. Yes, we do have a little bit of double-stranded nature to our RNA with the whole uh, folding of tRNAs and, and risk uh, type complexes there, but it's it structurally is very different from what you'll see in the double-stranded RNAs of viruses. And then lastly, there's TLR9 as an internal endosome because yeah, there's more than just viruses, guys, that can infect the inside of your cells. There's certain bacteria and protozoa that can get inside of there, and I feel like people don't talk about that much. But anyways. Ah. So, in addition to ligand specificity, the functions of individual TLRs, toll-like receptors, are going to differ in the type of cells that are going to be expressing them. So neutrophils uh, express TLR 1 through 9, but not 3 mast cells, and, and as you're going through these, think about what each and every one of those is doing. TLR3 is really designed for detecting viruses. Neutrophils don't really play a super large role in dealing with viruses as much as they do other types of infections. Mast cells express TLR1, 2, 4, and 6. Okay, so just kind of, this is just fun, fast things that you should keep in your head. Um, monocytes express a large variety of them because monocytes will differentiate into macrophages. Okay, so this is an example here. Don't overthink this. So all that we have here is toll-like receptors. This is TLR4, this is TLR3. On the endosome, this little thing here in orange is the double-stranded viral RNA, and this is TLR1 and 2. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you don't know anything else, just know that toll-like receptors result in the production of cytokines. And cytokines are really just proteins that are designed to recruit cyto meaning cell, kin kinesis. They recruit cells of the immune system to get in here. So macrophages are usually like this thing of them as you know being regional specific, right? Um, so yeah, okay, obviously we have neutrophils, dendritic cells, and natural killer cells and other things, but really just focusing here on the, the macrophages. I have a specific type of macrophage for a specific tissue. It stays there. It's bound there. It doesn't move around. I have a specific one for my skin. I have a specific one for my liver. I have a specific one for my respiratory tract. And so these guys being the front lines, essentially, or the first to fight, are going to be the ones who are going to encounter the pathogen first, and they're going to be the ones that are going to secrete the cytokines that are going to recruit other cells to come to the site of the infection and to fight, off the, to fight it off. I'm not going to talk about this, but just as a 
looking at things, structures that are unique to them, lipopeptides, um, glyco, what is that, glycosyl, phospha, tidal inositol, that's a very long thing, but just know that it's a unique structure of parasites, lipotychoic acid, that's gram-positive bacteria, zymosan, this is a feature of fungi, lipopolysaccharide is the poster child of pathogen-associated molecular patterns, RNAs, which tells us viruses here, right, uh, unmethylated CPG-rich DNA tells us that it's a bacteria or a certain types of DNA viruses. Don't forget about that. Double-stranded viral RNA, and then lastly, flagellin, which is why we have it on TLR5 homodimer here. But uh, a good place to have flagellated bacteria, where you can find that is in the intestinal epithelia. Okay, so here's where it kind of gets crazy. A lot of people get overwhelmed by this, and a lot of people freak out about this. But don't don't let this kind of get to you, I guess, would be the what I would say here. So, anytime we have binding here, and this is giving an example with TLR4, but it's with all toll-like receptors do this. The variable which changes is the specific um, sub-steps between each of them. So all we need to know for this, this isn't cell biology, this is the immune system, is that lipopolysaccharides, or some type of a pathogen-associated molecular pattern is going to bind to the recognition domain with that leucine-rich repeat sequences here. And this binding here usually doesn't happen by itself. It has helpers. In this context, it has CD14, MD2, and lipopolysaccharide, or, <laughs> lipopolysaccharide binding protein, or LBP is what the shortage way that we call this. So this binding here is going to induce a conformational change in the TIR, the toll interleukin receptor domain. This conformational change is going to get this whole cascade of events going on here. So this whole thing here, this is from here really it's all the way to here. This is the signal transduction pathway. The only thing that you really need to know is that we have activation of IKK and IKK is going to free up and release NF kappa B. So IKK is a kinase enzyme. If you think back to, well, the other time you may have heard this was with, um, if you've taken biochemistry, you know what kinase enzymes are, but also with uh, substrate level phosphorylation, kinase enzymes are just enzymes that move phosphoruses from one position to the next. So in IKK, it's going to phosphorylate um, IKB, which is going to free up NF kappa B, which results in transcription for, it's a transcription factor for cytokines. So we're producing a lot of cytokines through the use of a signal transduction pathway. One of the things that you'll, you'll notice is for things that are really long, complicated accesses, like clotting or uh, hormonal accesses or anything like this, is that the longer the axis is, the longer the cascade is, the longer the whatever it is, in this case the signal transduction pathway is, the more fine-tuning, the more precision we have. Precision, that's an S, by the way. Precision. Anyways, so the more precise it is. And that's why these things are so long and so complicated, because we really want to fine-tune the way that we express those genes. Because we want to have damage control. We don't want to hurt our own cells. We want to kill the pathogens. Okay, so that was a lot of information. So let's just review... Uh, what we have talked about so far. We have, and then we'll talk about that right actually right now. So structurally of them, there is the the ligand binding domain. And then the site for the ligand binding is the leucine rich repeat region, and this is usually facing the quote-unquote outside, but remember that we can also have it in endosomes. So the leucine-rich repeat region is the part of this that's involved in that. They are almost always dimers, and they can be either hetero or homodimers. Homodimers. For the li actual process of ligand binding, I'm going to do this in magenta here, we have helpers, right? The, the, in the example we gave for TLR4, the help with the ligand binding came from lipopolysaccharide binding protein, CD14, that's 14 by the way, and then MD2 I think is what we had called it there. That's the, these aren't specific because different toll-like receptors have different helpers that are involved in, in that process there. Okay, so 
what this binding, ligand binding here, the leucine rich repeat sequence here, is what it's going to call undergo a conformational change which activates, in this context, some type of a kinase enzyme. Okay, so the activation of this kinase enzyme is going to free up a transcription factor. In the example of the uh, TOR4 pathway, it was IKK was the name of the kinase, and the transcription factor was NF kappa B, and this is a transcription factor which is going to go undergo trans, it's going to go to the to the nucleus and starts to making transcription happen that is going to increase the production of cytokines and it, that's the main thing that's the primary I guess so the primary product of this transcription factor is that but the other product is adhesion molecules adhesion molecules okay so the two types of TLRs that we have I'll do it in blue are the ones that deal with intracellular pathogens, pathogens on the inside of the cell, and extracellular. I'll do that in a different color. And extracellular pathogens. Okay, so for intracellular pathogens, they do this exact same thing. The, the variation doesn't really change a whole lot. Um, where's blue? blue? These tend to be bound under endosomes or vesicles. And they consist of TLR, the TLR numbers, specifically the ones that we talk about for that. This is 3, 7, and 8. And what's in a name isn't really important so much as you understand it. 3, 7, and 8 are viral specific. So they only deal with viruses, which is nice. It's where you want them to be on the inside. For the ones, the other ones though, there's not just that one. Sorry, cleaning up here. For TLR9, this is on endosomes or uh, vesicles, these deal with just, they also deal with viruses, yeah, but they're also specific for bacteria and other, I would assume, other uh, protesia as well, because. It's not like malaria is a parasite that kills half the world or kills more people than people do. But, you know, for some reason we don't talk about that. Anyways, for extracellular pathogens, as you may imagine, these are on the cell membrane. This consists of the toll-like receptors, numbers 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. And these guys are going to deal with all non-viral pathogens. Sweet.